dream you create in fiction or the content you share in nonfiction. The universal pattern at the core of every great book, Martha calls the universal story. In structuring a book, she'll introduce you to the four phases and four energetic markers of the universal story. Learn practical techniques to tap into the universal story and better direct the flow of your book to connect with your readers at a deep and profound level. And isn't that what we all want? What is left after the end of your book has the potential to transform not only you as the writer, but all those who read your book as well. The plot whisperer, Martha Alderson, is committed to social, political, and spiritual change in the world through her actions, her words, and her books. I told you about her latest workbook, Boundless Creativity, a spiritual workbook for overcoming self-doubt, emotional traps, and other creative blocks. And um, I do hope you all enter the contest at the link that um, Elizabeth put in the chat window. She writes and lives in Santa Cruz. If you follow her online, you can often see beautiful pictures of the beach if you need that every day in the ocean and maybe even some surfing pictures. I don't know, Martha. Uh, learn more about Martha on her website, MarthaAlderson.com. And she's on pretty much every uh, social media outlet there. So let's welcome Martha Alderson. Thank you, Lori. Hello, everyone. Good morning. And um, yes, Lori's right about the pictures I put up on Instagram. They are of the beach where I live in Santa Cruz. Um, however, because of all the smoke that we've had and how unhealthy the air quality, I haven't been able to get out to do that. So I'm really, really looking forward to a blue sky day um, and that the firefighters are well and um, able to rest. Um, they've had to really do a lot of um, intense work. It's, it's horrible, you know, the whole West is burning. But beyond that, let's just talk about something better. <laughs> so I'm known as the plot whisperer for the help that I give writers with their plots. And I've been, I've spent pretty much my entire career empowering women's voices first through plot because plot wasn't really taught um, years ago. It was thought that it might stifle the creative process. So screenwriters knew all about plot, which are, you know, those days it was very male driven. But um, by being able to teach women about plot, it really empowered them to be able to write novels and memoirs and screenplays um, that would really um, captivate their readers. And then I expanded into supporting all creative people because I really found that we all go through this universal story. We all go through the same journey that the protagonist goes through. Um, we go through it as we try to create anything out of nothing but our imaginations. And um, you know, it brings up a lot of issues. It's an opportunity to really grow and expand who we are as individuals. And I've become almost more fascinated in that than in plot because now plot is pretty much taught everywhere and is um, and is readily available. So today I'm going to talk about the universal story. But first, I just want to say I did write a blog post for um, the San Francisco Writers Conference blog. And you can still find that on their blog um, for the San Francisco Writers Conference. And that article I wrote was talking about um, starting at the end of your book. So for fiction, if you know who your character is going to be at the end or what they're going to do at the end, you can then deconstruct the character so that you can better introduce them at the beginning and then understand in the middle what do they need to learn and grow and, um, and you know, sort of tap into a new set of beliefs or skill sets or abilities or whatever. And then for nonfiction, by knowing what you want, how you want your reader to be at the end of the nonfiction book that you've written, what you want them to sort of have been transformed themselves by having read your book, 
you can then do a task analysis, which means you can then break down everything you need to introduce and where it's best to introduce those concepts in order to, um, you know, help the reader to continue to turn the pages, help them to really um, get involved, committed, and be open to being transformed or changed at a at whatever level you want them to be, either a profound level or just, you know, understanding some new concepts or whatever it is that you're writing about. So today I want to talk about the four phases of the universal story and the four energetic markers, because um, whether readers know this, most of them don't, you know, all of us who've been read to as children who continue to read throughout our lives and live life, there is this certain pattern that we expect in books that the, that the energy is going to rise and fall. We're going to learn different things about the character at different places along the line. And if you're aware of that sequence and how that unfolds, the better you're able to really hook into the reader um, so that the underlying structure provides as much um, you know, direction and information to the reader as the characters themselves, the scenes, the setting, the dialogue, all the other aspects of um, plot and story. So I don't know if you can write in the comments section, but I'm really curious to know who of you that are listening this morning are writing nonfiction and how many of you are writing fiction and how many of you are maybe writing both fiction and nonfiction. Um, it'll just be sort of a curious um, opening to get a sense of who's with us this morning, um, since I can't see you, but you can see me. So whether in fiction or nonfiction, either way, by the end of the story or the book, the protagonist has changed and even at depth, say, transformed. Um, you show the readers through stories and you inspire readers through books. Oh, here we go. So fiction, fiction, both. Fiction, poetry, both, both, both. Okay. All right. Got it. Great. Okay. So, um, Elizabeth, could you put up the PDF, please? Uh, Martha, you have to share your screen first. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> then I will, or then you. Okay. So, oh, there it is. I can do it. There. Did that work? Yes. Cool. Okay. So this is what I call the universal story. And what I want you to see is that um, the, this line is what's all important here. And I want you to see how the line travels upward, drops down, and then travels back upward again and drops down again. So this is an energetic pathway. And this pathway is connected to everything. Um, you can see it in nature, you know, the seasons of the year, the lunar cycles, all of it sort of go through the same sequence of, of this energetic pathway. And it also shows up in stories. Um, you can go into any novel memoir screenplay that you admire or that is, you know, something that is close to your um, voice or your genre or whatever, and you can break it apart and you can find these, this energy, how the energy rises and falls and you can also find these energetic markers. Um, and I really recommend that you do this because it helps you um, see what other authors do, how they treat this universal story form um, in their own individual, unique, creative, imaginative way. So, you know, although it may feel like it's um, a structure that might limit you, it doesn't really, it allows you then this sandbox and that you can create anything you want within that. But this is what your reader expects and feels most comfortable 
when they have some sort of a sense of expectation or anticipation of what may or may not come next in your story. So um, the more that you're able to understand the rhythm of this line and this energetic pathway, the more empowered you become. Because once you see it, <laughs> especially if you do it from movies, you know, if you figure out how many minutes the entire movie is, divide it into four, and then and then look at those time, you know, at each quarter, um, you'll see these uh, energetic markers hit almost exactly on target. Um, in books, there's a lot more leeway, but you'll still find that there is this these major turning point scenes that I call energetic markers. And you'll see that they fall relatively in the space that I'm showing here on the universal story. So um, let me first just kind of go over all of these words on this form. So the first quarter, um, when down at the bottom where I say for writing books, I just call it the beginning. It's the first quarter. For inner work, you know, because all of this also comes up in boundless creativity, um, it's note yourself. So, and it's also sort of goes with writing books because it's about knowing the character. You're, you know, at the beginning, you're introducing the characters, the thematic significance, um, you know, foreshadowing what's coming. You, you know, everything is set up at the beginning. And this is a time of comfort and, um, but also separation because once everything is set and ready to go, then you move into the second part of the universal story which for writing books, um, you know, if you're writing a novel or memoir, uh, we call this the light middle, um, and it's a quarter of the page count, word count, or the timing in a movie. Um, and for inner work, it's called the sea of creativity, because this is where you launch off and you actually move into doing something new and different. <coughs> and then the next part, is the dark middle. This is where the energy of the universal story rises to the highest point in the entire story so far. And it is uh, an impactful time. It wakes up the reader. It's oftentimes shocking. Although if you look back, you can see the foreshadowing leading up to this moment. Um, but this is a moment where energetically things happen, big things happen. And so this third phase of the universal story is for the inner work is known as uh, to dive deep. This is where you're really diving in. You're really going deep into, um, you know, issues that you hold, belief systems that you have and all the rest of it. So there's very much a parallel between the inner work you're doing and how you're using this when you write a book or write a story. And then at the end, it's the last quarter and it's the prize. This is where the whole story, everything is culminating to the moment of triumph. So you can see that these uh, um, four phases each have um, what I call an energetic marker or a major turning point. And at the beginning, it's no turning back. Once you cross the threshold from the beginning into the light middle, you know, everything shifts the intensity of the story rises, the expectations become more exciting because the middle of a story is where the real story takes off. This is the main story is in the middle. And then smack dab in the middle of the middle is the recommitment or rededication scene. And this is a time when, uh, you know, when we start to make a real commitment to go the distance, all of a sudden things go awry and we're challenged and we're, you know, and we're asked to do things that we don't think that we're capable of doing. And in order to go the distance, we have to recommit at that point, as does your character. And then all is lost. This is the dark night of the soul. This is the breakdown that creates a breakthrough for the character. This is a moment where if the character in a story has a fatal flaw that has interfered with them, <clears throat> you know, getting what they want in life or their goal, um, you know, that's established at the beginning of the story, um, 
this is where all is lost, where, you know, whatever she thought that she was going after, she's totally wrong. She thought so-and-so was the murderer, and then she finds that person is dead. Um, or whatever happens. It's just, it's a, it's a time when the character might have to come into consciousness of understanding that they're the ones that are getting in their own way. In other words, that they, their procrastination, their judgmental, their fearfulness, their, you know, whatever it is that, that, that is their fatal flaw that might have served them well early on, like in the first quarter, the beginning, but now in the middle, as things are becoming more and more intense, this fatal flaw has to be overcome. And this is where this will happen, where everything is lost. The character then has to figure out what part did they play in that failure and what are they going to do about it? And so when the energy drops after that is a time of figuring out what happened, assembling everything that the protagonist needs in order to prevail at the end. And then once they start on the, the pathway up toward the triumph, this is the end. And every step does not get easier. If anything, it's more difficult for the protagonist. Um, but they know what's expected. They've learned. They have a new belief system. They have skills and abilities that they learned in the middle that will now serve them well um, to be able to seize whatever it was, the prize at the end. Okay, so I hope you all got this. I'm gonna stop sharing this for now so I can see <laughs> what's going on here. Um, Okay, so let's talk a little bit about these sections. Um, so the middle is a time that is um, that most writers really struggle with. You know, I've said this before, <coughs> but for lots of writers, they'll spend the all their time in the first quarter of the book. They love introducing the character. They love getting things set up. This is for fiction and nonfiction. They love introducing, you know, spending all this time preparing. But like I said, the real story doesn't start until the middle. And once the character and the reader cross from the beginning into the light middle, that's where the energy starts to really build. That's where the excitement and page turnability really start. And so this is where writers really flounder. You know, you hear all these, <laughs> all these terms that people use, the muddy middle, the messy middle, the, um, I can't think of what all the words are, but you know what it feels like. And so writers will get to about the middle, that recommitment stage, and they'll want to run back to the beginning again, because it's easier. You're not going deep. It's introductory. And it's like, um, for all of us, you know, when we first meet someone, unless you tell your whole life story to everybody you meet, we're on our best behavior, we're sharing, you know, things we want people to know about us. But as the relationship develops, we go deeper. People start to see our flaws, start to see inconsistencies, start to realize the depth of who we are. And that's what happens in the middle of the story. And that's why I think it's difficult for a lot of writers because they haven't gone deep themselves. And so to go deep with the character is threatening. So I just really want to support you in thinking about writing what you're writing, fiction or nonfiction, as an opportunity to grow and transform yourself as an author, to see the challenges that you come up against as opportunities. I view all obstacles, setbacks, all of the things that get in our way as being presented there purposely in order for us to grow and change. That we have to figure out a way past these boundaries, these you know, dilemmas, these problems that we have, that we're being presented them because there's something we need to learn in order to prevail, in order to get what we want in life. We have to become conscious of who we are. We have to 
dig deep and see how we get in our own way, you know, the horrible things that we say to ourselves that we would never say to anybody else about, you know, oh, who cares? This doesn't matter. No one's going to read my book anyway. Who am I? I'm not smart enough for this. I'm not whatever. Um, so as you're allowing the, um, the protagonist to be confronted with obstacles and setbacks and challenges, which is what you want in the middle. You want, you know, that's the territory of the antagonists. That's where all the antagonists, either people or situations or, you know, whatever you want to interfere with the protagonist getting what they want, you know, the goal that they set up or that you set up at the beginning of the story. Um, you want to start to show what those um, what those obstacles are. You want them to fit thematically with your story, that they feel right for this character, that they don't just come out of the blue for no reason, or if they do, that there is some foreshadowing or, or it will start to make sense later in the story. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the middle is a time of spending, you know, of putting up barriers and obstacles for your protagonist, which is not comfortable for a lot of writers. You know, we get invested in our characters. We love our characters. For some of us, the characters in our stories are closer to us than real people, you know, that we just love to spend time in our imaginations and in this world that we have built for ourselves. And to think about doing mean things to our characters is just devastating. You know, it's like, oh, I can't do that. I can't strip that away from the character. I can't, you know, have this other character do that to the my protagonist and, you know, and we try to protect them. But that's what the reader wants to read. They want to see what will the character do when the character is not in charge, when something is difficult, how will the character react? You know, the character cannot give up. We can as writers and, and tragically, way too many talented, brilliant writers do give up because of, you know, self-doubt and all the rest of it, which is why I wrote the workbook. Um, but the protagonist can't in a story. And you can't in a nonfiction book. I mean, you can give up, but you want to keep showing the information that you want the character to understand and to grasp in the middle of the book, because whatever that is, is going to help them in the end to achieve whatever it is that they, the reason that they picked up the book and have been turning all those pages. And then the thing that's really difficult for writers who love their characters is to put them through a dark night, to put them through an all is lost. Because at that point in the story, you know, the reader has been reading for three quarters of the way through the book. They deserve to have this big moment where, where the energy shifts and things go awry. It wakes the reader up. It knocks the protagonist over the head, makes them have to think things differently. And, it's, um, and from there till the end of the book, things move really, really quickly. So, um, but to think about stripping the character of everything, you know, making them homeless, making them lose their job, getting a divorce, you know, somebody dies, um, you know, their house burns down. I mean, all the horrible things that we're going through now are like a dark night of the soul for lots and lots of people right now. I mean, they're really struggling and they are at that point. And it's a dangerous, dangerous place to be as a person, because unless you're really strong, you know, you can have a lot of um, self-doubt and a lot of, um, you know, fear. And it takes enormous courage to keep going and to face what's happening around you and to understand what it's going to take for you to pull yourself out of this um, dark place. Okay, so... Um, All right. And then when you get to the end, like I said before, this is not an easy journey. None of it should be easy. You know, we want to turn the pages quickly, which means that we have to feel like things could go horribly wrong for the protagonist at any moment. 
We want to learn more about who they are. We want to be able to compare how they react to situations by how we react. Would we react in that same way? What does that character tell us about ourselves? Um, what are we trying to learn about life itself through this book? Which is why um, at the close of a book, either a nonfiction book or a, or a fiction book, is the reader has learned something new and now feels changed, inspired, uplifted, informed, whatever it is, to make them ready to express their fearless truth. That was what we were talking about yesterday, expressing your fearless truth. But um, you know, that's what writing for change is all about, is by inspiring your reader to um, get to know themselves better, to live a bigger life, to not be held by, back by fear or whatever it happens to be. Um, okay, so I think what's important is to know who you're writing this book for. You know, you may start out writing it for yourself, but at some point you need to figure out who is my audience? This is for fiction and nonfiction. You know, when I wrote the Boundless Creativity Workbook, I knew I was writing it for all creatives. I knew how I wanted them to feel at the end of the workbook. I knew I was going to take them through the middle that was going to be really hard. I didn't realize it was gonna be as hard as it is because I've heard from lots of people who are going through the workbook and um, it's hard. I mean, they're coming, they're bringing up a lot of pain. And, you know, part of me wants to run away from that and say, oh my gosh, you know, I want to make it all better for you. But um, what I, but I also know that the tears that they're crying are a purging, you know, it's allowing whatever has been hidden down there in the depths of who they are to bring it out into the light is transformative and it will make them a better person as long as they stick with it and don't give up partway through the um, through the um, project. Okay, so let me just, there are some questions here. Let me look and see if I can answer any of these. Do nonfiction how-to books follow the universal story energetic pathway? Yes, they do. And in the same way that you want the energy of your book presentation to follow that energetic pathway, that what you're introducing at the beginning is different than what you're going to bring in the light middle, how you are going to present what's going to be in the dark middle, you know, and though that's the place where you can bring up um, Sorry, I get distracted. Anyway, that that can bring up, um, you know, whatever it is that is going to be hard, difficult, challenging for the reader, and then to bring them up to the triumph at the end in a way that's pleasing for them to understand that, yes, this may be difficult for you in a how-to, but that, you know, once you get there, what's in it for them, you know, how you're going to feel about yourself, how you're going to feel about what you do with what you create. Okay, here's another question. What does beginnings can last a lifetime mean in this context? So what that means is that lots and lots of us never leave the comfort of the beginning. We can talk a great story, we can tell everybody in the world about what we're thinking about, what we're, what we want to undertake, how we are going to go about it, you know, all of these things. And yet when it comes to actually doing it, we falter, we don't follow through, we move on to something else, you know, to leave the comfort of the known and move into the unknown is very frightening. I mean, I remember when I sold my speech language and learning disability clinic and I decided I wanted to become a writer. <laughs> Who knows why? And um, but it was tough. You know, I went from being someone, I had a title, I had respect, I had all kinds of people depending on me and, you know, this sense of who I was that once that was gone and I was undertaking something I had no idea what I was doing. You know, I wasn't a writer. I had grown up dyslexic and nonverbal. I didn't have a clue about how to write. 
a novel. Um, so you can understand how that could really cause a lot of problems. And if I had been, you know, <laughs> if I had been more aware of what I was getting into, I'm sure I still would have done it. But it's almost better for us not to know what we're going to come up against because otherwise we might not do it. Okay. If trying to follow the hero's journey, how important is it to hit all the steps in order? Can I combine steps? Can I jump around in the steps? Can I skip steps? How about the inciting incident? Does it all need to be in chapter one or background and character first? Well, so yes, the universal story is um, started off from uh, Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey. Um, but as I worked with the universal story and Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey, I realized that it, was, it wasn't broad enough. It was talking about a protagonist. And generally speaking, in most cases, it was a male protagonist, you know, that the man would leave the comfort of the beginning, cross over from there's no turning back by taking up, you know, his sword and going out to kill off all the dinosaurs or whatever their dragons and or take their guns and go off to war, leaving the women and children at home to fend for themselves or whatever. You never really hear about that part. But um, that wasn't really working for me. And I also was seeing it in too many other places um, to see it as just a hero's journey, but that I saw it throughout all of life, that it is this energetic pathway that connects all of us together. And yeah, you can combine steps, but these energetic markers or major turning points really need to have focus and, um, you know, to really be able to hold their own at that place in the story because it's a marker. It's a, alerting the reader, something is coming. There's a shift coming. Things are not going to stay the same as they were. So it's important to think about these four energetic markers as real, you know, if you think about structuring your whole story, if you can work from the first energetic marker to the second and from the second to the third, you're not having to encompass the entire book in your head at once because these sections, these four parts or phases of the universal story have their own set of parameters and expectations. And if you focus on those, become very aware of what's needed there, then you can transition into the next phase through the energetic marker. So it's a way to be able to make a project not as cumbersome and overwhelming by trying to keep all of these balls juggling in the air at once. All you need to know is what phase you're in, what scene you're in within that phase. Is it a is it an energetic marker? And the energetic marker can be made up of more than one scene. You know, there's a lead up to it, there's the event itself, and there's a reaction to the event. So um, all of that is is um, there. Does it need to be in the first chapter, the inciting incident? No, it doesn't need to be in the first chapter. And um, you don't want background in the first chapter. If you're going to tell a lot of backstory, you heard me say tell, um, I really recommend waiting until you get into the middle. You're trying to hook the reader. You're trying to hook the reader to, you know, commit to reading your story. That happens at the beginning. And so you want to bring them in in a way that is inviting, makes them feel comfortable, makes them feel like they can handle this story or the book, the nonfiction book that you're reading, whatever. And then you can digress. And because what you want at the beginning is to have it be in real time. You know, because this happens, the character does this next. Because the character did that, then the character has to do this, um, you know, through this kind of cause and effect. But if it's in real time, the pages move, you sink into the story, and you feel comfortable. If you're moving, jumping back and forth in time, um, 
early on, it can be very disconcerting. And from my background in special education, you know, most readers aren't going to blame the author. They're going to blame themselves and feel like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe this isn't a book for me. Whereas really, it's just a formatting problem. Okay. What suggestions would you give for the flow of a poetry book? Well, again, I really believe in the universal story. You know, if you start out with the poems, you know, if you have a thematic sense of what you want your poetry book to um, sort of encompass, you know, what poems are you going to include? What poems are you not going to include? And what is the thread that keeps them all, you know, related and working together? And then to be able to draw the reader into the story in the same way, you know, through comfort and inviting and making them feel like, oh, I can handle this. I understand these poems. They make sense to me. You know, I get the feel of them. They're speaking to me. And then they, you move into the light middle and things become a little dicier. And then in the third phase, you know, your poems could turn maybe darker or, you know, depending on what you're trying to convey. Um, and then at the end, you know, it's sort of this celebration, um, the moments of triumph, of, um, you know, transformation, of change, of, you know, hope or whatever you're trying to convey. Okay. Can you talk about the midpoint and how the story is supposed to turn there? How does the story change at that point? Okay. So the protagonist, wait a minute here. Have I gone over my time, Elizabeth? I just noticed what time it is. You're just fine. This okay. is technically right on time for question and answer. So. Okay. Um, talk about the midpoint. Okay. So again, the midpoint is the reader has read for half of the book. They have a sense of what's going on. They like the character. They like the setting. They're intrigued by the themes that are being brought up in the story. And, you know, they're, they're moving along with the character. And then for the character themselves, this is for fiction. When they, you know, when it comes time in the middle where they really realize what's ahead for them, you know, they've suffered some setbacks. They've had some challenges they realize that what they're undertaking is not going to be as easy as they thought. And I think that it goes on for, um, you know, this is for the writer themselves. They start out thinking, oh my God, this is so fun. I love these characters and you can't wait to sit down and keep going. And then, you know, as you're going along and you get into the muddy middle or whatever you want to call the middle, you start to flounder and you start to think, oh my God, what have I taken on? I don't even know what I'm doing. I have 10 million plot lines. I, you know, I don't know how am I going to get to the end? You know, I've got way too many pages, whatever all those questions are. Well, the same thing happens to the protagonist. They start to realize, wow, to solve this mystery is going to be a lot more dangerous than I thought it was, or to, you know, get the guy or whatever the story is about. They start to understand what is required of them to make the commitment to go the distance. And once they are there in the middle of the middle, they are tested to see if they're willing to make that kind of a commitment because the next big thing that happens is the dark night or the all is lost or the crisis. You know, it's like a crisis that, that anybody can go through. And so what the middle is also doing is that it's sort of pairing back all the other, you know, subplots and things in order to bring into focus what's at stake right now in the middle so that the reader is prepared because what comes next is going to be darker and darker and darker. So you want to be able to get the protagonist to recommit but also get the reader to understand, okay, we're now moving into darker territory. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Oh yeah, so sorry about the timing, I get it now. 
Okay, what advice would you give a younger you if you could go back in time? Oh, it's just not to be so scared, you know, not to be so, so frightened by life. And um, yeah, to be more courageous, to understand that uh, it doesn't matter what anybody else says. It only matters what I say, who I am to me, you know, whatever anybody else says about me is about them. It's not about me um, and not to be so scared. Okay. Can a fiction be structured as in, wait a minute, where did that go? Sorry, I just lost one. How does one go deeper and become vulnerable? I find that even after a few drafts, I am blocked from doing so. Um, okay, so 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 you're saying that you are being blocked from going deeper with the character and allowing the character to become more vulnerable, or that you're having trouble um, allowing yourself to become vulnerable. So, I mean, I love that because if that's the truth, um, I, whatever we do creatively, whatever we do in life is all about creativity. You know, it's starting from nothing and creating something out of our imaginations. I mean, we create our life, you know, you look around you, you made this happen. I mean, it's, you know, it's all an illusion. It's just created by us. And so um, what I want you to understand is that the opportunity to write a book can be superficial. You know, you can write a book that is entertaining, that is, you know, whatever it is, a love story or whatever. Um, but for some of us, we want to go deeper. We want to expose the reader to the depth of character that is not really mentioned in real life, you know, that we hide secrets, we only expose enough of us that we feel comfortable um, sharing. So we never get the full drama, the full dynamic of the people that we're interacting with. I mean, you hear that all the time. Oh, I never even knew that about that person or whatever. Um, whereas in stories, we want to be able to go deep. We want to get to know the characters. We want to go underneath the surface because that's where we will grow and change. So if you're writing a book um, to change people, um, it's important to be able to go there. So if you get blocked from doing that, you may want to enter the contest for the uh, Boundless Creativity Workbook that this very generous um, person has donated to the conference. Um, you may want to enter that contest so you can get the workbook so you can go deep for yourself if that's what the issue is. And then um, please explain again, what is an energetic marker? Okay, so an energetic marker is, are these four major turning points in a story. When you're aware of what these are, you have everything you need to be able to create a page turning book. So I really recommend pulling off the shelf of your, you know, the library you have at home or whatever, and um, figure out the page count, the total page count, divide by four, put a post-it note at the first quarter, the second quarter, you know, the midpoint and the third quarter, and then read the book again. As you're reading it and you're getting closer and closer to the first turning point or energetic marker, which is no turning back, become aware of how is what is happening. What's the writer doing to change and alert us, foreshadow, prepare us for what's coming this next moment. And they're energetically charged. These four energetic markers, I call them energetic markers because they're marking the energy of the story. This is where the energy is intense because a change is coming in the book. A change from the beginning into the light middle is coming from the light middle into the dark middle. These are moments that are big moments. 
um, in the story and in the universal story um, as a whole. Uh, let's see, I see successful novels. Let's skip the beginning. She should have a first line. They shot the white girl first in paradise. How does this relate to your structure? Well, um, yeah, I mean, you can do whatever you want. What, what I'm suggesting here, there are no rules in writing. Um, and you can jump where, you know, you can start the story wherever you want. You know, for a long time, everybody was talking about start with a big bang, you know, start with the most intense moment of the story. But what can go wrong with that is that energetically, you know, if you start at a high point, you really need to keep the energy of the story rising from that point. If you um, start at a high point energetically, you know, in, in, in intensity, and then you drop way off, it's like you then have to build all the way back up to that moment again. So it really just depends on, you know, how you want to convey your story. When you're starting out, I think it's nice to be aware of the linear pattern. And for a lot of writers, this is very counterintuitive. You know, what I do is plot um, and the universal story, and it's very linear, logical. You know, it's it's in most writers, at least, you know, lots of female writers in, especially are very right brained, you know, very creative, very disorganized, very, um, you know, steeped in the details and the sensuous, um, you know, details of the story and the setting and all of these things. So even if it feels, you know, like one of my best friends when I used to teach plot, her hands would start sweating if I'd ever even start to talk about it because she was so um, not linear and logical and it just didn't make sense to her. But what I recommend is just to lean into it, give yourself a chance, you know, do research. That's how I learned about plot was I just researched so many novels, memoirs, and screenplays and broke them down to see what did the uh, writer do and what happened to the character? How did, where, where did these things fall? And, you know, I mean, I was doing um, classic novels too. And, you know, Steinbeck and Faulkner, you know, I'm sure they did not, you know, they didn't count their scenes to get to the right energetic marker. It's this rhythmic pattern that's within us, but I wanted to try to expose it so that you could then um, use it to your advantage. But you can do anything you want. I mean, you know, you don't have to adhere to any of this. It's just that I wanted to pull aside the curtain and give you a glimpse into the deeper structure of a story in order to empower you to write the story of your dreams. We have one question left and about a minute left on your session if you wanna answer that one. Okay. Questions. I'm sorry, guys. We're going to have to switch sessions here at 11. So one more, one more of the two questions there. What are the biggest mistakes you see authors do with plotting? Um, the biggest mistake I see them do is that they don't do it. They don't, you know, when I do a plot consultation, I always start at the end because that's the least, that's where writers spend the least amount of their time. They know the beginning frontwards and backwards. And oh my God, they get so depressed when I won't let them start there because they're ready. But I make them begin at the climax, at the triumph, at the end, so that I can see who is the character, who do they visualize that to be, so that I can then deconstruct the character to understand what's going to happen where and why. So um, thank you so much, Martha. We really appreciate this. Well, thank you. It was a joy. And again, I hope that you will enter the contest for a workbook. It's on the Writing for Change um, website. And just write something about, you know, if you get blocked or if you have emotional traps or whatever. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. You guys hang tight with me while I switch the sessions. And we will be um, joining back in just a moment with Proving Your Point, Believability and Authority in Fiction and Nonfiction with Joey Garcia, Tony Waters, and Anita Filicelli.